Hey everyone, I'm Kevin Wallace, pastor of Redemption to the Nation's Church. And listen, today I'm going to be bringing a message that I trust will bring life and hope and peace to your heart. We need peace in these troubled times. We can find it in the word of the Lord. I want you to call your friends, your family, let them know that this message is getting ready to be preached. I want them to join in and be blessed by it as well. Now hang on to the end. I'm coming back to pray for you and your need. Can't wait to see you then. May the Lord bless you. Let's jump into the word today. I want you to go with me today to the Bible. <laughs> it's a good place to go when you're going to preach. I want you to look at a, the first chapter of the book of Hebrews and the 11th chapter of the Gospel of St. John. We do have about 150 people who are traveling home right now from LA and I just want to do two things. First of all, I want to give God thanks for what he did this week in LA. Y'all, we, we saw people born again. I saw a deaf woman healed. I saw it. I saw it happen in front of my eyes. We were at the Bonnie Bray house. If you don't know anything about, how many have ever heard of Azusa Street? Anybody ever heard of the Azusa Revival? I was at the Azusa, uh, I, I went to where Azusa Street was. We had a three hour prayer meeting there. That was glorious. But we went to the Bonnie Bray house where it started on the front porch and a precious lady and her friends had begun a prayer meeting that swelled in attendance and it got so full that the front porch of the house fell in. And they said, well, we better find us another place to have church because this place can't hold us. It was at that prayer meeting though that the Azusa Street Revival was born. And we went to that Bonnie Bray prayer house and a woman, I mean, there were people, all of our students were there and there were people from Venezuela and Guatemala and Salt Lake City, Utah. It was just this wild God moment where everybody came and this woman was standing there and the, they come and got me and, they, and I was trying to just watch all over the cars. It's not in the best neighborhood. Cars were getting broken into, so I was playing security, hallelujah. <laughs> That's what pastors do when they're not preaching, they're security, hallelujah. They come and got me, they said, Bishop, this man wants you to pray for him. He's from Salt Lake City, Utah. He's a pastor and he sees all these kids dancing, praying in the Holy Ghost. He wants this in his church. I went over, I said, what's the name of your church? He said, Ruach. Come on, come on church. He said, the name of my church is Ruach. I said, you can't be called Ruach and have a dead church. You gotta have some movement happening. Power of God swept through that place and one of his members was with him and they started praying for her ears and her ears got healed right there on the street at the Bonnie Bray house. She couldn't hear. God healed her ears. People got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Y'all, we had a whole mess. We had people laying in the road. I'm not ashamed of this thing. I said, I'm not ashamed of this thing. I've come too far and I really don't give a rip what people say about us when the heavens break open and the river starts to flow. You don't say, Lord, this is a little bit different. You say, I've been waiting on this my whole life. Religion hadn't done it for me, but the Holy Spirit can. Anybody thankful for the move of God happening in our day? Somebody give him one more shout of praise. Oh. So they're coming home. I I would appreciate you praying for them for their safe passage back home. And, uh, and I flew home last night because I wanted to be here. Uh, Hebrews chapter one and John chapter 11. If you would put your finger on John chapter 11, we will go there just after we read Hebrews chapter one. And I wanna preach today on this thought for a few minutes. The prophet, the priest, and the king the prophet, priest, and king. How many know Jesus Christ filled every office? When he came, he was the prophet, the priest, and the king. Somebody say amen. amen. And I wanna start in Hebrews 11, or pardon me, Hebrews chapter one, verses one through four. And it gives us a beautiful picture of this man, Christ Jesus, who filled these offices when he came as the Messiah. And then what I intend to do, if the Lord will help me, is go to John 11 and show you a practical uh, life 
application, uh, as it were, in the person of Jesus Christ, how that manifested in and through his life for a man named Lazarus and how it's going to happen for someone in this room today and somebody watching online. Hebrews chapter one, verse one, say amen if you have it. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, say the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us, spoken to us. God has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name. How many know he is better than the angels? And how many know his name is more excellent than every other name? Someone say amen. He, let's go to John 11. I pray you will not judge my character by what I'm getting ready to confess to you. But as a child, this was my favorite scripture to quote. Some of you would think it was because it is the shortest passage in the whole Bible. I like to think it is because of the deep theological complexities that I was considering as an eight-year-old child wanting a lollipop for memorizing the most scriptures. But it is the shortest passage in the entire Bible. The 35th verse of John 11 simply says these two words, Jesus wept. Would you say that with me? Jesus wept. The prophet, the priest, and the king, let's pray. Father, help us today. Lord, I pray for the people of God today. We need your word, and we need your truth, and we need revelation to come. That only comes by the person of the Holy Spirit. Preaching can be done without you, but God, it doesn't change lives. So today, God, I pray you would help me to preach. And I pray the anointing that makes preaching life-changing would come. I pray that the people of God would step into this anointing with me today, God. I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus to rest upon us. In fact, can you just throw your hands up right now? Put your Bible down, your device down. Can you just ask God to let us experience a spirit of wisdom and revelation as Paul would pray it in the book of Ephesians? God, just let a spirit of wisdom and revelation rest on us. Our minds, eyes, hearts come open now as Christ is preached. I thank you, Holy Spirit that you're bringing victory. Lord, someone in this room today needs deliverance from darkness. Today, those chains are breaking. I decree and declare in Jesus' name that the power of the Holy Spirit is setting them free. So align us today, God, and do it by the power of your word. We ask it in Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. To be seated in the presence of God. So we're... Um, Today we begin what is on the church calendar called Holy Week. It's the holiest of seasons in the church world. And today is, as Pastor Jeremy said just a few moments ago, today is what we refer to on the church calendar as Palm Sunday. It is the day we commemorate Christ coming into the city and the children are dancing and singing and they're celebrating and they're waving palm branches and they're throwing their clothes on the ground and they're saying, Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, and the city is really celebrating his arrival. It's a, it's a powerful thing. The people are saying, perhaps this is our Messiah. This is our moment. This is, this is the, 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 the political takeover, the military takeover. And, and, and how many know he comes in a different way? Because his kingdom was not of this world. And when Jesus came, he didn't come to overthrow Rome because Rome was a temporary enemy. He came to overthrow the permanent 
eternal sort of uh, 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 enemy of the people of God. And it was this kingdom of darkness and his kingdom. Jesus came to establish his kingdom and it was not of this world. And it all really begins this week. And I usually, when I come to the pulpit on Palm Sunday, I'm inclined to usually preach from the text of him entering the city or we preached about the colt that was tied up and how he loosed the colt and we preached about the Last Supper and we preached a bunch of different kind of messages on Palm Sunday. But this, this Sunday, as I was preparing and leaning into the assignment for this week, I was drawn to what the Orthodox Church calls Lazarus Saturday. Everybody say Lazarus Saturday. Now we talk about Palm Sunday and then we talk about the week, the Holy Week that happens and what happened on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. He cleans the temple out and then on, uh, then he was betrayed and then, then he has the Last Supper and then we have Good Friday when he is crucified and we have Dark Saturday and then Resurrection Sunday. And, and, and we're, we're here for all of it. We preach all of it because how many know we, sh we should make a really big deal about Jesus Christ? Amen. We should make not just one time a year. His name shouldn't just be mentioned one Sunday a year, but we should talk about Jesus every Sunday because the reality of it is there's no hope for humanity without Christ. There, there's no peace that passes understanding without Jesus Christ. And, and, and this week, being the week of passion, looking toward the crucifixion and looking toward Resurrection Sunday, somehow I just felt like the Holy Spirit helped me to zero in on this Lazarus Saturday. And, and, and to, to sort of uh, remind the family that the entire Passion Week, this is called the Week of the Passion of Jesus, this entire Passion Week of Jesus is set in the context of Lazarus' resurrection. I want you to know that the teachings of Jesus made the Pharisees mad. The miracles of Jesus stirred the hearts of the people and they really began to reach out and say, this is our Messiah because the blind see and the deaf hear and the lame are walking. But something significant happened when Lazarus was resurrected. In fact, it was the resurrection of Lazarus that really precipitated and accelerated the, 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 the attempted murder, as it were, of our Lord and Savior. They weren't really nervous until the dead man got up from the tomb after being dead for days because what they were saying is the Pharisees were saying, wait a minute, we can handle his teaching and we can overcome his teaching and we can try to explain away his miracles. But when a dead man who's been dead four days gets up out of the tomb, something's getting ready to happen in the city and nothing can stop this man, Jesus. And it was this miracle of Lazarus and the resurrection of Lazarus just a few days before Jesus himself is betrayed that becomes the context, the backdrop, as it were, of the entire Passion Week. And as I considered that, I, I, I was reading the text over and over. The book of John, the 11th chapter, the story of Lazarus is one of my favorite, and it is so deep in theology, and it is, it is so practical, but it is so profound because it answers, it answers some of the questions you and I have. It helps us wrestle through some of the seasons that we walk through. It helps us say, thank God somebody else went through a season like the one that I went through. Because when I read the story of Lazarus, I immediately begin to see this fact that Jesus has a way of thinking that is oftentimes very different than our own. God has a way of operating that is sometimes very different than the way we would operate. Come on, talk to me, somebody. And this should come as no shock to us because the prophet Isaiah would remind us that his ways are above our ways and his thinking and his thought processes are above our thinking and our thought processes. We are often after one thing and God is often after something much greater than the one thing that we're after. Come on. We're, we're often seeking something and we think we know the road God ought to take to get us to the place that we want him to take us to. But God often has another route to get us to where we're going to. And the reality of the Christian life is not that we are simply excited about serving a God who is a genie in the bottle and does it our way but a God who is infinitely wiser, infinitely better. He's more good to us than we could have ever believed and yet sometimes the route he takes to get us to the breakthrough is a very different route than we anticipated. I say that to you because when I come to this text, the first thing that happens, the first thing that it says, it suggests something about Jesus that is complicated for us to understand and that is this, he heard his friend Lazarus was sick. 
They had the faith to reach out to tell him, come pray for Lazarus, he's sick, and Jesus has the audacity to delay. What do you do when God waits? What do you do when you think Lazarus only has a few hours left and if you're going to do the miracle, you better do it now. And and Jesus says, yes, he only has a few hours left, so instead of coming, I'm gonna wait two days. Y'all don't like that, do you? We don't like it when God waits. But I have discovered that with God, God often delays because we think we know what's good, but God is waiting on greater. God is waiting on greater. Greater is often in the delay. Come on, elbow your neighbor, say greater is in the delay. Yes, I'm learning how to cook with a pellet grill. Has anybody ever cooked with a pellet grill? If you've never cooked with a pellet grill, I'm learning how to cook with a pellet grill. All of my life, I cooked with charcoal, I cooked with gas, and when you cook with gas or charcoal, you cook it quick. But a pellet grill, you can actually smoke a brisket, and it takes a while. You gotta marinate it, soak it, and cook it slow and low. And sometimes we want something quick, and we want something fast, but sometimes, and it's good. I can make a great hamburger in about four minutes, but how many know there's a difference between a hamburger and a Texas brisket that has been soaking and marinating and cooking at 250? Ah, uh, y'all ain't saying nothing. In fact, some of y'all gathering your stuff thinking about going home to eat right now. I want to tell you sometimes there is greater in the delay. You want something microwaved. God wants something marinated. Learn how to trust him when he doesn't show up when you want him. I can't to tell you he is always on time. One Southern Gospel, and you know, I I listen to Southern Gospel sometimes, and sometimes those lyrics on them songs are the funniest things, because they do everything looking for a rhyme. (laughs) But one of my favorite songs written over the last 10 years from the Southern Gospel uh, 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 genre is, isn't it great when he's four days late, but he's still on time? How many know God is always on time? And even when he's late, he's always on time. And this story of Lazarus is profound because theologically it reveals the sovereignty of God and, 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 it, and it still reveals the compassion and the love of a Savior even when he delayed. And so I read to you Hebrews chapter one because Hebrews chapter one verses one through four is a microcosm of this ministry of this man named Jesus who was the Messiah. Everyone say Messiah. And the Messiah was more than a, it was really a term for the Jewish people who were waiting on the king that had been prophesied from Genesis to Malachi and would come to deliver the people of God, the people of Israel. But when Jesus come, he did not just come to deliver Israel, he came also to deliver humanity because the reality of it is the enemy of Israel is the the enemy of every human being that has ever lived and that enemy is sin. That enemy is Satan. Come on, talk to me. That enemy is darkness and Jesus came to deliver Israel and Jesus came to deliver the whole world. And if you ever want to see this in the old covenant, then you recognize from Genesis to Malachi, whenever the people of God got in a mess, God anointed men from one of three offices to deliver the people of Israel from their bondage. Those three offices were the prophet, the priest, and the king. If you read from Genesis to Malachi in the Old Testament, when the people of God got in trouble, God would raise up a prophet, a person that would speak the heart of God to a wayward people and God would lead them back and he would give them a restored purpose. He would often speak prophetically through the prophet and although their moment was dark and their life was racked with pain and it looked like things were hopeless, God would always raise up a prophet and the prophet would say crazy stuff like Jeremiah 29 11. Behold, I know the thoughts that I think for you. They are thoughts of peace and not of evil. The prophet would say crazy crazy stuff like Zechariah to his enemy. He said, don't gloat over me. Though I have fallen down, God will raise me back up 
again. How many are thankful for a prophetic grace that God will often speak, come on, prophetically in the midst of your mess. God doesn't speak in agreement with the mess. God speaks beyond the mess. God speaks beyond the temporary. God speaks before the nasty now and he talks about your future and he brings you hope for tomorrow. Have you ever been in a mess but got a prophetic word that broke the yoke of hopelessness and suddenly you started having this feeling that everything was going to be all right? Have you ever been in a mess backed up in a corner and it looked like the devil had your number but God sent a voice into your life and prophetically declare it's not over with yet. Well, I don't know about a prophetic church. If you don't go to a prophetic church, you'll die. The prophetic word of God is what pierces through the darkness of the enemy. It's what brings hope for tomorrow. When it looks like the enemy has won, the spirit of prophecy will rise up and God will anoint your heart with a word that brings hope for the future. And so there was a prophet anointed to deliver God's people and then there were priests. And these high priests would do the ministry of going before God on behalf of the people. And the people had committed sins and sins and sins. And once a year, the priest would come before the the presence of the Lord and he would offer a sacrifice. And he would offer prayer and intercession on behalf of the people. Come on. This is why Aaron, the high priest, would walk to the people of God and stretch his hand out over them. And he would say, the Lord bless and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. The Lord be gracious unto you and give you his peace. What was he doing? As the priest, he was standing between God and the people. And he was saying to God on behalf of the people, bless these people. They don't deserve to be blessed, but I want you to bless them. They didn't earn the blessing, but I'm asking you to bless them. That's what a priest does. Come on, family. A priest never goes to God and says, give them what they deserve. That's why Moses was a priest in the Old Testament. He stood between God and the people when God wanted to get rid of the people because of their sin. Moses said, if you're going to kill them, you got to kill me. Don't kill them, God. Give us mercy. How many are thankful for the ministry of the priest? And then in other places in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, there were kings. Kings that were anointed by the Holy Spirit. They would pour oil on these kings and these kings would stand in the place of authority and they would, they would lead the people of God. And there aren't very many good kings in the Old Testament for you and I to glean from, but there is one. We call him the sweet psalmist of Israel. His name was King David, and he had a heart after God. He killed giants, he killed bears, he killed lions, all in the name of protecting the people of God. And I want you to know today that leadership will, our people in our nation, our people in our churches, our people in our homes will only live a life of blessing if leadership that is over them has the kind of heart that honors and pleases is the Lord. I need some help right here. I want you to, I've had people rebuke me, try to rebuke me, but they're wrong. I'm not. I'm in the Bible. The Bible is right and they are wrong. We need to elect people who fear God. We need to elect people who will as best as they can lead with the heart of God. When the righteous rule, the people rejoice. Kings and leaders of the old covenant, whenever God anointed them, David was a leader like that. It was one of two times in the entire history of the Bible where the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom were joined together and operated in unity. Unity is the result of glory. I don't have time to go down this road too much, but unity is the result of glory. The Bible says so in the book of Isaiah. It is the glory of the Lord that causes the people to come together. You cannot get in a huddle and call it unity if there is no Jesus. 
Jesus is the glory and he is the one that brings unity, which explains why most churches operate in division. If you don't have Jesus and you don't have his glory, you can't have true unity. And when you don't have glory and when you don't have Jesus, then what you have is a desire to be unified, but you got people bowing their knee to every kind of God and we call that unity. That is not unity, that is mass confusion. There is, we can't sit in a circle and sing kumbaya and call that unity. There is unity when the king walks in the room and everybody builds their life around the king. David was a king with a heart after God. And he led the people of God. He fed the people of God. He protected the people of God. And so you have this trifold office, uh, these three offices in the Old Testament through whom God would often lead to guide and protect his people. The prophet, the priest, and the king. And I read to you Hebrews chapter one, verses one through four, because it is a concise paragraph. It is this this beautiful expression of the man Christ Jesus who came and fulfilled all three prophecies in one person. All three offices were fulfilled in one person. The messianic ministry of Jesus was a fulfillment of everything that was given as a type and symbol from Genesis to Malachi. The prophets of the Old Testament were pointing us to Jesus. The priests of the Old Testament were pointing us to Jesus. And the kings of the Old Testament were pointing us to Jesus. And when he came, he did not just fulfill one office, he fulfilled all of them. And so Hebrew says, in time past, God spoke through his prophets. But today, he's speaking through his son. I tell you, there is no prophet like Jesus. Y'all better say something in here. We often think of him as just Jesus the Messiah. He was Jesus the prophet. You don't believe me? Ask the woman at the well how she felt about him. He was, he was so bad to the bone, he started reading her mail. And you know, she was a tad bit religious, talking about we worship here and y'all worship over there. He said, yeah, where's your husband? Where's your husband? Well, I, 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 I don't, I, uh, I'm with one right now. Uh, uh, he's not my husband. You have said rightly. In fact, you've had five. Well, hold on. Who are you? <laughs> Can't you see this woman? It's funny to me. Who are you? And how do you know my business? See, he's the prophet who knows how to peel into the past and to get through all of that religious facade that we usually offer up to God. And he, he climbs right through all of that garbage and gets right to the heart of the matter. He said, you had five and the one you're with now is not your husband. That's six. But I am Jesus, number seven. And because I've come into your life, can't you see this thing happening? It's about to come to a completion. She's been looking for a man her whole life and a prophet who told her everything she ever did has now come. Jesus was a prophet. And the Bible said, watch this, he spoke through prophets of old to our fathers, but today he speaks through his son. Those words jumped off the pages to me. Jesus is speaking. You hear me? God is speaking through his son, Jesus. I want to tell you right now, Jesus still has something to say. How many are glad he ain't through talking yet? Oh, uh, if you got a problem, this will be a good, good place for you to shout right there because he ain't, he's not through talking to the enemy. He's not through declaring good things about your future. The prophet is still speaking on your behalf to your situation, declaring better days are ahead. Jesus is speaking. He not just spoke, he is speaking. I wish I could find some help. He not only spoke, he is still speaking. If he's still speaking, Things are still changing. Boy, y'all acting awful tired and look like a bunch of Baptists today, but I'll take every one of you because I want you to know nothing about your situation is final as long as God is still speaking to you through his son, Jesus. There is no trial you are enduring. There is no valley you are walking through. There is no flood that is trying to overtake you that has the final say as long 
as God is still speaking, I feel like preaching it here to myself, as long as God is still speaking, heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of our God shall abide forever. How many are thankful he's still speaking? Slap your neighbor, tell him I found a prophet. I found a prophet. It's not, a, it's not my mister or sister prophet down the road. I found a prophet who is able to speak with 100% accuracy. And when he opens his mouth, it causes things to get in alignment. I have a prophet. He's a prophet. And then he is not only a prophet, he's a priest. Now this is where it gets crazy. Cray cray. He is the offering and the offerer. In the old covenant, you had to have a priest who would make an offering for himself so that he could get clean enough to bring the offering to God in the holy place and put the blood on the altar. So you had a priest who was unholy. He had to make an offering for himself so he could get holy, so that he could bring a holy offering and offer it on behalf of the people so that judgment would be stilled and life would be granted to the people. But when you flip from the old covenant to the new covenant, the book of Hebrews tells us, can I give you some theology today? The book of Hebrews tells us not only was he the offering, but he was the offerer. In other words, he didn't take a lamb. He took himself. God, I feel like preaching here, Torrance. He took himself. He could find nobody greater, so he swore by himself. He could find nobody holier, so he took himself and he laid himself on the altar for the sins of the whole world, which is why Hebrews 1 verse 3 said, he by himself purged us from our sin. I'm looking for a priest who will give God an offering so that I can live. There wasn't a priest holy enough that could walk into the holy place all by himself until Jesus came and said, yes, I'm the lamb, but I'm also the priest. And the priest took himself because himself was the lamb. And when he took himself in, he laid himself on an altar so that we could have eternal life. That's why I praise Shundo Kaparama. That's why I praise him on a Sunday. That's why I praise him on a Monday. Because he took his holy self and laid it on an altar for my sin. He's a prophet. He's a priest. And then, can you put that third verse back up there from Hebrews 1? And not only did he purge us from our sins by himself, but he sat down. He sat down. Can I give you a revelation today? He's seated. Kings don't pace. Kings don't pace. Jesus is not up in heaven. What am I going to do? What am I going to do here? How am I going to do this? Oh, she needs her bills paid. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? Oh, he found, he found a mask. What am I going to, how am I going to handle this? How am I going to handle this? Oh, oh, Abby's precious Jackson was born prematurely. How are we going to help him? How are we going to help him? He's not pacing. You know what he's doing? You know what he's doing right now? Oh, I think I see something over here in the dark. Oh, no, I'm going to take. This one looks more comfortable. This one looks more comfortable. You know what he's doing right now? Touch your neighbor, tell him he's seated. God, I feel like preaching. He's seated. While hell howls, God is seated. While hell hisses in your ear and threatens you and harasses you, while the nations shake in the turmoil of its own trial it created, he sits high. He's 
defeated. He's not a he's not a king who was elected. He's not a king who was appointed. He doesn't have a tender getting ready to expire. He was born king. And when he offered himself to God and he rose on the third day, the Bible said he stepped on a cloud and he ascended to the right hand of the Father and he sat down because it is not just halfway done, it is finished. Somebody shout yay! I wish you would find three people and shake their hand and tell them, neighbor, he's seated, so have a chill pill. He's seated, so you ought to sleep tonight. He's seated, let the devil howl and hiss. The devil is defeated. God is exalted. Jesus is Lord. He's the King of heaven. He's the King of earth. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. But sit, but, but, but sit down because that's not what I came to preach. I mean, sort of it is. But what I want you to see is this manifestation of this threefold office fulfillment in this man, Jesus, from the text of Lazarus. Watch this. The story of Lazarus becomes the foundation and the setting of the week of his passion. And it starts, as I told you, with two sisters mad that their brother was sick and Jesus didn't show up on time. Don't lie. There's some times you've been frustrated at God. Oh yeah, 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 you sit out there and look so holy, but you've had some thoughts you had to cast down. Be real with me. Oh, I don't ask God questions. Yes, you do. You just don't ask them out loud. And don't rebuke me for asking God questions. Because Jesus himself said to the Father, why? Why hast thou forsaken me? Y'all ain't going to help me today. I want to tell you as your bishop, I've had some questions. There been, and I didn't make him answer me. I didn't stop serving him because he didn't answer me. But there have been some seasons I walked through that were not on my radar that happened out of nowhere. And I found myself saying, why? How? What did I do? Can we have a real honest conversation? Because sometimes we're so interested in sanitizing our journey with Jesus that we take out the pages of frustration. I feel like preaching right here. We take out the pages of questions. We take out the pages from our life of the failure. We want everybody to think we speak in tongues and have gifts operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But there's been some days I said, why? And this is where Mary and Martha are. We want you to come and he waits two days because greater is in the waiting. And he gets to Bethany. So it, he waits two days and then he journeys two days. And so now Lazarus has been dead four days. And he gets there. And when he gets there, Martha runs up to him, slightly attitudinal. <laughs> so I can, some of y'all sisters in here like, oh, I know, I know. I know what she had. Had you been here? Y'all ain't real. Y'all, y'all. Had you been here? I appreciate this about Martha. She was saying you have the power. I am never questioned your power because had you been here, he would be alive. Had you gotten here, he oh, I feel him in here. Had you gotten here, this cancer wouldn't have showed up. Had you gotten here, this divorce thing would have never happened. Had you gotten here, had you showed up, I would have never went bankrupt. Have you ever had those feelings? Rise up like Martha had the courage to articulate. Had you been here, this wouldn't have happened. But I know 
On the one hand, she knows he has the power. On the other hand, she believes that the power he has will be demonstrated in some place in the future. She said, even now I know he'll live again on that day. There'll be resurrection. And Jesus said, Martha, I am the resurrection. You're not waiting on it to get here. It's here. Look at somebody tell him it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. Resurrection is not just something. It is something coming in the future. But I thank God for the moments and the miracles that happen in the nasty now. This is why people want to argue about the coming kingdom is the place in which God's power will be demonstrated in fullness, yes. In totality, yes. But I'm thankful that the kingdom is not only a later kingdom, it's a now kingdom. And there is a breaking through of kingdom power and authority in the nasty now. And, and he says, watch this, um, go, go to John 11, I believe it's about verse, uh, I'll tell you, I should have told you, but I, I'm in a mood here. It's over in verse number, uh, verse number, it's when he says, oh yes, verse four, thank you, thank you, John 11, four. Can you put that on the scripture? 11, 4, verse 4. Yes, this is the prophet. <laughs> Jesus heard that he said this sickness. When Jesus heard that, when he heard them say he's going to die, Jesus the prophet spoke. <laughs> this sickness is not unto death. That's the prophet speaking. He's looking at a situation that looks horrible. He's looking at a situation that looks inevitable. He's looking at a, situ at a situation that looks irreversible. And in the midst of the darkness and the grip of the grave is on the throat of Lazarus. He looks at that situation and he says, this sickness is not unto death. I feel like preaching about Jesus the prophet. Has he ever spoken something contrary to what you were going through? Has he ever given you a promise that was different than your reality? Ah, oh, I don't know about you, but you're going to get to a place in your life where God's word to you is greater than the reality surrounding you. You are going to get to the place in your life when you're actually able to believe that what God said is greater than the report you see with your net for faith. We the just do not live by what they see. The just shall live by faith. Jesus the prophet has the power to speak a word that changes the outcome of your situation. He's the prophet. He says this sickness is not unto death. In fact, in another place on down in the scripture, it says something even crazier. He looked at the disciples and said, we gotta go wake Lazarus up. He's asleep. No, 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 that's the longest nap a man ever took. A four-day nap? Jesus said, we got to go wake him up. He's asleep. And they looked at him and said, if he's sleeping, let him sleep. He'll get better. And Jesus had to say it plainly for them. Don't miss this. He had to say it plainly for them. Lazarus is dead. He actually had to retract what he said because they didn't have the faith to see that in the midst of him being in a grave, Jesus knew it was temporary and he was going to get up. The disciples actually thought he was speaking in the natural, but he was giving an idiomatic phrase to describe the temporariness of the nap he was taking. To some, he was dead, but to Jesus, it was just a nap. He said, he's not dead. It's not unto death. It's just sleeping. And they said, oh, let him sleep. And Jesus had to tell them, okay, we're going to play that game. He's dead. I'm going to go wake him up. Then he comes. The prophet has spoken. He will not die. He comes to the edge of the city. Now, mind you, this is Bethany. And the last time he came there, he almost died. It's the reason why when they heard Lazarus was sick, Jesus said, we got to go see Lazarus. Two days later, Jesus said, now it's time to go see Lazarus. Watch this. His disciples looked at him and said, uh, we don't need to do this. Uh, 
last time we tried this, you almost died. Aren't you thankful God will get in the mess? Even if it means he puts his own life on the line, he'll get in the mess for you. He comes to the edge of the city and the Bible says in the book of John, the 11th chapter, that they ran out. Mary ran back and Martha ran back and told Mary. Mary comes out to the edge. Watch this. And when the Jews and Mary and Martha came to the tomb of Lazarus, the Bible said they started weeping. The prophet speaks. The prophet Jesus will declare things over your future, but the priest will sit down by you and weep with his people. For we have not a high priest who can not be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. Can you imagine this unfolding? That the God who created the universe starts crying. Oh, he's got all power. Yes, he's got all power. But I may, I'm thankful he's able to sup. Y'all know what that word is? Sup. That's that King James thing coming through right there. He's able to weep with us while we weep. We always talk about the might and the strength and the power and the anointing. And how many know he has it all? He can do anything at any time. He's God all by himself. If he walked on the water, surely he can pay your electric bill. If he can make deaf ears hear again, surely he can lead you into the right job. I mean, can somebody help me in here today? what blows my mind is that even though he has the power the priest has the compassion to sit down and weep Jesus well I come to tell you God can change your situation and your future but while you're waiting he'll weep with you this doesn't particularly apply to everyone and not everyone can appreciate this, but if you've ever walked through a season of loss, he'll weep with you. When other people sympathize, Jesus actually feels what you're feeling. When other people feel sorry for you, Jesus actually feels what you're feeling. When other people just kind of say they need a season of being alone, Jesus never left us alone. I need to praise him, not just for the times he anointed me to preach and when I felt like I was on a mountaintop, but I want to praise him for the nights nobody ever saw me pray, no one ever saw me weep, no one ever knew I was going through it, but he loved me enough to come in the room and sit down beside me and shed some tears. I know y'all can't handle this, but this is the kind of high priest we have. He understands the pain. He understands the rejection. He even knows what betrayal feels like. Have you ever been in a season where you're broken? God is not a million miles away from you waiting on you to recover so that he can be your almighty God. He is always almighty, but while you're weeping, he'll hold you. While you're crying, he'll console you. He'll reach down and pull you up. He'll wipe the tears out of your eye as he wipes the tears out of his eye. And he'll say, come on, we got a job to do. We're not through yet. He'll weep with you. He's the high priest. Not only was he the priest as he wept, but he was the priest as he prayed. For the Bible says in the 41st and the 42nd verse that he prayed to the Father. He, watch this, La I'm almost done, but Lazarus is in a tomb. He's in the dark, he's dead. The grave has a grip on his throat. He is dead, dead. The worms are invading his body. Rigor mortis is setting in. Four days dead, his family said, whatever you do, don't remove the stone because by now he stinks. I wanna tell you something. If your family says you stink, you stink. <laughs> he was four days dead. It doesn't just mean they thought he might stink. When you read it in the Greek, he was actually already stinking. They smelt him. Don't roll that stone away. They, they, it was like this. You can't do this. This is how many church people come to church. They come to church like this. Don't sit them in this church. They stink by now. That's why you ain't praising God. You're squeezing your nose because you don't want nobody to smell. You don't want to smell the flesh and the sin and the mistakes and the failures of everybody sitting on your row. But I want to tell you, we smell you too. 
We could smell you too. We could smell your aroma, sister, yay, yay. We could smell your failure, brother, flip flop. We all stink. We all have a stitch. First time guests are like, I don't know if I'm coming back here. Everything about us stinks. What, what is the one thing that can hide the stench of death and darkness and failure? It is not some religious problem. It is not some little religious brand. The only thing that is greater than the stench of the death that we brought in here with us is the glory of the risen Christ. It is the glory of the power of God. If the glory ever breaks through, nobody talks about how much we stink. Everybody sees the glory. He, he actually goes and prays for Lazarus. Lazarus is dead and Jesus is praying for him. Why? Because he's the priest. And the priest ever lives to make intercession. Can I tell you why you were snoring last night? Somebody was up praying for you. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I covered your prayers. Come on, tell them, I need your prayers. But if you ever fail to pray for me, somebody is. Somebody is praying for me. That man is Jesus Christ. The high priest is interceding for us. One more and I'm through. The prophet said it's not unto death. The priest wept and prayed for He wept with the family and prayed for the dead one. But the king is about to stand up in this story. And the king said, take me to where you placed him. And can't you see the look on these people's face? They smell him while they're getting close. What is he getting ready to do? Because he got worms and he stinks by now. His body is setting up with some rigor mortis. Surely he's not getting ready to do something crazy. And he said, take me to where you laid him. And the king stands up. The prophet prophesied. The priest wept and interceded, but the king stood up and he did not request it. He did not suggest it. He said, Lazarus, get up out that grave. Come forth. I better be careful right here because some of y'all got a taco on your mind and I got a breakthrough on mine. I want to tell you right now that God is about to speak and God is about to decree some things over your future. It is not a suggestion. It is not a request. When a king operated in the Old Testament, he never made a request. He sat on his throne. He extended his scepter. And whatever the king said, everything in the kingdom had to come in line with the decree of the king. Slap your neighbor and say, neighbor. The king is making a decree over you today. You are the head and you're not the tail. You will be blessed and you won't be cursed. You will be blessed in the city. You will be blessed in the field. You will be blessed when you come. You will be blessed when you go. Your past is under the blood. Your future is under the blood. Your right now is under the blood. You are blessed because the king said you're blessed. Well, pastor, I've been dead four days. That's all right. God is about to talk to the worms that invaded your life. And the worms are coming out. And the stench is coming out. And the body is being restored. You're not going to stay dead. And I thought that, I'm done, stand with me. And I thought that was the last piece of the king speaking over Lazarus. But there was one more command that the king made. The first command came when the king said, Lazarus, come forth. But then the king turned to the disciples, the ones that put grave clothes on him. Uh -huh. He said, I told you this wasn't unto death and you buried him anyway. I'm going to raise him from the dead, but you are going to take the grave clothes off of Lazarus. I don't know who you've buried, but you're about to help them take off the... I don't know who buried you, but we're going to help you strip off the grave clothes today. Look at somebody tell them the king is calling. The king is calling. If you feel dead, he ain't dead. He's still alive. He's not done with you yet. 
And Lazarus comes out bound. And he looks at them and says, now you loose him and let him go. And you know when the king and the priest and the prophet have been in the midst because the man who was in a tomb in John 11, can you go to, I didn't, I'm pulling one on you here now, John 12, verse one. Can you put that on the screen, please, we are, Chad? John chapter 12, I gotta give this to you before you go. John 12, verse one. Okay, get verse two ready because I'm gonna read this. Gonna, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, had, had no, 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 where you going? No, 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 about to get good. He had been dead whom he had raised from the dead. Next verse, watch this. There, I'm getting ready to preach myself into a fit. There, somebody say there. The same place where you died. The same place where they buried you. The same place where they wrapped you up in grave clothes. The same place they put you on the front page of the paper. The same place they made fun of you. The same place they criticized you. The same place they said it was over. The same place the devil, he prepared your tombstone. In that very same place, right there, they made him a supper and Martha, Served, but Lazarus, Lazarus, the one who had been dead, Lazarus, the one they said it was too far gone, Lazarus, the one they said there was no hope for, he wasn't laid in a tomb, he was sitting on a table, slap your neighbor, tell him we're moving from the tomb. God's about to turn this thing. God's about to turn this thing. God's about to turn this thing. We're moving from the tomb to the table. Shout if you know God's got the power to do it. We're moving from the tomb to the table, from the curse to the blessing, from lack to more than enough, from pain to fruitfulness, from sickness to healing. It took Lazarus four days to get that dead. It took Jesus one day to turn his situation all the way around. I don't know who needs to hear this, but you and your situation are not so far gone that the prophet, the priest, and the king cannot fix it. He will speak, he will sup, and he will decree and declare. Lift your hands all over this room right now. Lord, I pray for the people. I feel especially, Lord, that there are people in this room today burdened. In the in-between. I sense Mary and Martha slightly offended, still trusting, believing you have the power, but not quite sure why you waited. I'll pray for everybody in a minute, but I need to pray for Mary and Martha real quick. Serving, but frustrated. Love Jesus has the confidence that he has the power, but don't understand why it hasn't changed yet. I believe he's turning it around for you. But until he completely turns it around, 
Somebody needs to ask God to touch your heart today so that you just keep on trusting God. Lay your hands on your heart all over this room. Father, I pray for hearts right now. I pray for Mary and Martha. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. I pray they'll not get bitter. I pray they'll get tender and trust you. You can't be trusted because you are faithful. If you're in this room today and you need God to speak over your situation and you need the prophet to decree and declare, I feel the Lord God intercepting some plans of the enemy tonight, right now. And he's going to intercept it with a word. This, you may get it from a person, but I want to tell you right now, if it's from a person, it's Jesus talking to you through that person. May it be so. But even if a person doesn't come, the prophet Jesus is rising up to speak. He's still speaking to you. And the king is going to decree something over your house in the name of Jesus. Reach over right now. Lay your hand on your neighbor's shoulder. God, somebody who feels like they could give up hope, not because they don't believe you have the power, but they, they've been wondering why. What have I done wrong? What sin is in my life? Is, is my past catching up with me? Is that why he hasn't moved yet? He's not through. Open your mouth right now and begin to pray for your neighbor. Come on, pray for him. Don't whisper it, pray for him. Open your mouth and pray for him. God, let people be released from frustration, misunderstanding, spirits of confusion, spirits of offense, Somebody has been frustrated with God. Uh -huh. Job said, I will not charge God foolishly. So, somebody has been tempted to charge God. And you've been tempted to say, Lord, you should have. You could have. You, why didn't you? But it's, listen to me. Listen to me. Those questions are human questions. Those questions are part of the journey. You're not crazy or evil because you've had those questions. And really, it doesn't matter what the questions have been right now. He's not, asked, he's not interested if you have the question or if you're waiting on an answer. What he wants to know is will you trust him? Somebody just pray for your neighbor right now. God, let us trust. Let us have complete and total kanto hoshanda. I feel the Holy Ghost working for some people in this room. I'm telling you right now, your faith has been under an attack and you're still decided to believe and the enemy piling on all of the questions and the confusion, but it's coming off your life right now. I feel faith rising up in somebody's spirit. I feel somebody getting back to the very thing that touched God the day you got saved. That simple confession, that simple trust, that simple believing. Work it, 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 turn it around, turn it around. Lazarus is stinking, but your glory is greater than the stench. Turn it around, move them from the tomb to the table. Oh God, move them from the tomb to the table. Move them from the tomb to the table. In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. And Lord, I thank you for the King. You are the King of glory, Jesus Christ. And when you speak, things come into alignment. So speak to the people today. If you're in this room and you need Christ to save you, and you need to get right with God, I'm not asking you if you go to church or if you've ever been to an altar. I'm asking you, are you and God good today? Or do you need to get right with God? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I need my sins forgiven. I need him to be the Lord of my life. I want to change today. Pray for me. If I'm talking to you, when I say three, lift your hand and say, pray for me, Pastor Kevin. I need to get right with God. One, two, three. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. God bless you. You can put your hands down. I want you to look at the neighbor on your left and right and ask them this one question. I don't care if you've never met them or you've known them your whole life. I simply want you to ask them this question. Do you need someone to go to the altar and pray with you? And if you lifted your hand, or you should have, when they ask you that question, I want you to get out of your seat and come down here. We're going to give our life to Jesus. We're going to pray and talk to God. And our faith is going to touch God. And God's grace is going to touch us. And he's going to save us. I saw some hands, but I'm not. God bless you, young man. Come here. Come here, buddy. Come here. God bless you. Come on. Come right here. 
Come right here, buddy. God bless you. Love you guys. Come on, this is a good day. Come on, there's still some more people coming. This is why we come to church. This is why we preach the gospel because there's nobody too far gone. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. There's some more coming. Somebody else wants to come. Come on out of your seat. Tell your neighbor, I need to go pray. Come with me. Come with me. Come with me. Come with me. I need to go pray. I want to get my life right. Come on. Anybody else? Come on. God bless your family. Come on. Come on. They're still coming. They're still coming to pray. Glory to God. Stretch your hands toward the altar right now. Would you do that? Father, they're still coming. Thank you, precious Jesus. Precious Jesus. Precious Jesus. They're still coming. Come on, sweetheart. Come right down here. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, praise God. Praise God. I need some praisers. We'll pray for them in a minute, but somebody join angels. Come on. Somebody join with the angels. Somebody join with the angels. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. And now I'm happy. Sing it one more time while they pray, come on. Come on, Jesus, do the work today at the cross. It was there by faith. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters who come to the altar today for salvation. I am thankful for the promise, the simplicity of the gospel, that upon hearing the truth, they who believed were sealed with the Holy Spirit. According to Ephesians chapter one, I thank you for the faith these men and women have moved in as they have come to this altar. Upon hearing the truth of your gospel today, God, and believing in this truth, they have been saved. And we thank you for the promise of their salvation. I ask today that you would keep them in the grace of God. And I ask that what they've started today, what you started today, God, give them grace in the journey because we know you will finish it in Jesus' name. And with open hearts and open arms, we welcome them into the family here. And we thank you for what you've started and what you're going to do in their future. In Jesus' name, and the people of God said, come on, let's give God praise one more time. Well, I trust that the Word of God is working in your heart in this moment. I know the Word works. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Maybe something said today has touched your heart. Maybe you feel like you are so far away from God. How could I ever get right with God? Friend, I want to tell you, there is a way to get right with God. It's through His Son, Jesus. Today, if you'll turn your heart and your life over to Him, I don't care what you've done and how bad it was, how long you've been doing it and how messed up you feel. Jesus is a friend to sinners. He'll come into your life. He'll turn it all the way around and change it. I believe by the Spirit of God, He's doing that right now. Let's pray. Open your heart and say, Dear God, come into my life and forgive me of all my sin. Lord Jesus, I need you to wash me and make me new. I confess that I've been a sinner. And today, I want to follow you for the rest of my life. Turn my life over to you, Lord Jesus. Come in and be the King of my heart. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Hey friend, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to know today's not the finish line, it's just the beginning. Go to kevinwallace.tv. Just drop us a line on our prayer request area. Let us know that you got saved. You gave your life to Christ. We wanna make sure you have a Bible. We wanna make sure you get plugged into a good Bible-believing church full of the Spirit of God. Listen, the journey has just begun and the best days of your life are in front of you. We're praying for you, for you here at Kevin Wallace Ministries. Can't wait to see what God does in your life. We love you all. God bless.